Welcome everyone to Live Stream Stars. Hope you're having a great Monday. Happy holidays, everyone. I'm Ross Brand. Every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we showcase talented broadcasters delivering high quality content across live stream platforms. And Live Stream Universe is brought to you by Live Stream Stars, uh, by LivestreamUniverse.com, LivestreamUniverse.com. Uh, with that out of the way, let's welcome in our guest, Kristen Cardos. Kristen is a community manager for Convince and Convert. She works with Jay Bear. For those who know, Jay Bear is one of the, I don't know, godfathers, founding fathers of, of the digital marketing uh, movement. He's certainly one of the most prominent names, a best selling author. And he has a new book coming out, Hug Your Haters, which is available now for pre order and uh, we'll ship at the end of February. Uh, Kristen also works with VB3 as a community manager where she um, does community management and some on-air work on uh, both the social business hour, hashtag SBiz, B-I-Z, hour. Um, I actually hosted the show today. You can uh, catch her there every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, it's also a Twitter chat, right? So you can catch her uh, on Twitter as well. Cloud Talk, uh, Community Manager Hangout, uh, T-Chat. Um, am I missing any? Sorry. I think I lost you, Ross. Or either you lost me. I'm not sure which. Nope, internet's still on. You know what? Welcome to Beta Life, you guys. It's so nice to see everybody in here. Thank um, you. He'll do be right back. Work I'm for sure. Um, this is a reality. <laughs> Audra said Kristen doesn't sleep. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit all over the place. But until Ross, okay, great. Thank you, Mitch. So nice to see Julian from my channel in here. I'm so excited tonight. I've been looking forward to this with Ross for several weeks now since he asked me. Um, he's one of my favorite people, so this will be fun. I'm trying to think of something else. To, oh, tell us about your new role. Okay, I'll do that while we're waiting for Ross. Um, I am very fortunate to be able to work with Jay Bear's team over at Convince and Convert. Um, he is amazing. I think Ross was starting to get into a little bit of a, an intro of, of Jay. I'm sure a lot of you know who he is. He is an author, speaker, um, fantastic blogger, hilarious person on top of that. I actually got to meet him um, two weeks ago and he's phenomenal. Um, so what I'm doing with Convince and Convert is I am doing social media and community management for Convince and Convert. Um, they consult with major, major brands. I don't really get involved on, on the client brand side of things. Um, I'm more doing initiatives and community for our actual um, Convince and Convert um, team and initiatives therein. So um, it's a lot of fun. It's an opportunity that I just can't even believe that I got. And I'm really excited. Ross mentioned T-Chat earlier. I was very lucky to be able to work with Megan M. Bureau and Talent Culture for a good portion of this year. And um, I'm not anymore, but only because I can't do everything. <laughs> but that was a phenomenal experience as well. Welcome back, Ross. Hey, thank you. Did you freeze up too, or was it just me? It was just you, I think. Oh, okay. So um, sounds like you were giving everybody an overview um, of, of your of your bio. So let's let's start out talking about what exactly is community management. People outside the social media sphere, this is kind of a new term. Even within social media, I think of Tim McDonald and community manager Hangout, and then now you're monitoring community manager Hangout. What what does a community manager do? What is community management? I actually love this question because the honest answer is if you ask 10 different people, including 10 different community managers, you get different answers. Um, in terms of the day to day and what it, what the nuts and bolts of it are, that can vary greatly depending on the person and, and the, the particulars. But the general idea is that you are a person who is interacting with people in a community for the purpose of um, keeping things orderly, uh, promoting good. Um, sometimes it means enforcing rules, you right. know, like old school uh, community <laughs> managers working in forums. We, we love to talk about the ban hammer, you know, if people get crazy. Right, um, right. 
basically just it's kind of like a um, sort of a spirit guide <laughs> for a group of individuals who are part of a community which that can be a social media community it can be on a on a specific platform um, that's off to the side a forum you know any of that and then also for some of us there's there are other things involved in it some community managers actually create a lot of content um, some community managers do a lot of um, social media management and strategy. I'm not really a content creator, but I, I kind of am involved with our social media initiatives and the community pieces. So I get to um, do my digital cheerleading thing, um, right. talk to people and also uh, brainstorm and try to execute some of the social media initiatives. And so when you got started, did you start on Twitter as a community manager or did you start on Google Plus and doing live streaming from the beginning? Oh, I love that question too. Um, actually, my roots in community management go back to before that was a thing, before it was recognized or had a name. Right. Um, I came up in, in forums, actually. I had a friend who started a nonprofit uh, forum around a mutual interest. And it just so happened that I had a lot of information to share about that. So she asked me to get involved and help be one of the forum moderators. So I got involved and I was doing that. And then my role kind of grew and this was a volunteer effort. My role kind of grew and I was at that for a few years. Um, and then I got to work with um, some Marines when we lived in Okinawa. And there was a piece of my job then that was kind of a PR social media. That wasn't the bulk of my job, but I got some traction and some knowledge uh, about the social media piece of community management. Um, but then in terms of like what I do now and how I got started in, in today's version of community management, it was definitely Twitter. And then somewhere along the line, uh, Google Plus came into being, right? And you started yeah. doing Hangouts on, on Google Plus. Um, because I, I think we, we talked once and I assumed, okay, Blab is a completely new animal for community management. Of course it isn't because you've been doing it on Google Plus, there's differences. So talk about what it was like on Google Plus before we get to, you know, what makes a good community manager on, on, on Blab. Sure. And honestly, for me, most of the community management related to the, the Hangouts on Air has still been on the Twitter side of the house because mm -hmm. what happened is I got involved with these, these chats that actually predate me, but they were incorporating the video along with the Twitter chat portion. So that would be Social Business Hour and Community Manager Hangout, and then there are others. So what you have is you've got this kind of disjointed but robust experience where you've got people talking on air like you and I are now, but then you also have the Twitter chat going on at the same time. Now, that is a very user specific experience and you can tailor it the way you want. Some people mm -hmm. cannot, cannot handle that much multitasking, it's distracting. So they might either watch the Hangout or do the Twitter chat. And then you had people like me who were just all about it. I have like 19 tabs <laughs> open. But for me, um, I loved seeing that dual delivery um, of those two things. So that was one of the things that attracted me to those particular chats. But for my involvement in terms of moderating them, it's really all been on Twitter. I've been on air sometimes, but mostly um, on the Twitter side, just trying to keep the conversation going. So, so how far back do the do the Google Plus Hangout simulcast Twitter chats go? How, like, how many years have have you been involved with those? For me, just about a year. Okay. Um, so the when, people you, that I, when you started, was it was it a bigger audience, much bigger audience on the Twitter side than on the Hangout side? Is that safe to say? Or I would say yes. Okay. Um, or at least that we were aware of in real time. Um, but the advantage there, um, of course, Blab didn't exist, you know, some of these other tools didn't exist. So the great thing about that was you had your live event and then you had content that you could share thereafter. You had this, this video that you right. could share thereafter. And of course, Blab facilitates that as well, but it was pretty, pretty groundbreaking. I think uh, Tim McDonald was really someone that pioneered that idea with the My Community Manager group and the CMGR Hangout. And so I think a lot of us um, nod to him for kind of, I, I don't know if he was the very first, but I know a lot of us sort of attribute the idea and the benefits uh, to him. He's a great guy. 
So is it is it all good doing a Twitter chat at the same time as doing a uh, live streaming broadcast or are there downsides to to trying to do both at the same time? It, it can be challenging. Um, I'm pretty good with multitasking, but, you know, a lot of people, like I said, they might be overstimulated or just too much trouble to kind of have all of those windows open at once. Um, I think that one good thing is no matter what, you still have two things going on that somebody could participate. So if they only want to choose one, that's okay. Now with Blab, um, one of the things that has occurred since we've started using Blab for some of these um, chats like social business hour or cloud talk is the Twitter activity is less. Right. I mean, right. bottom line, there's less Twitter activity there, but there still are people on Twitter and there, and we've also been able to reach new community members that we may not have otherwise found because they weren't really into Twitter chats. So we actually have people now that are participating with the hashtag on Twitter that actually didn't even do Twitter chats before. Um, that's probably something that other people would, would say they've observed as well. So, so now um, I often participated in the Twitter chat side, um, mm -hmm. but, but never joined the Google plus hangout. Whereas once blab came along, I, I really, have trouble wanting to keep up with Twitter because I'm so engaged in what's going on and there's a discussion in the chat box. So that alone is enough to keep me, keep me busy. Absolutely. So I find it's really, uh, is that, is that something unique to blab that there's just much more conversation than there was on Google plus or was there as much conversation? Yeah. Oh, okay. As compared to, as compared to Google plus, that's exactly, you, you hit it dead on. Because Google uh, plus limited the number of people who could be in the room, right? Um, yeah, but it's like eight or 10, okay. it's, it's a, but on, on air and then anyone could be watching it and make comments. But, um, the thing is with that, with that dual delivery of a Google hangout on air and Twitter, you had two things going on. But if you look at blab, you really kind of have three, if you're doing a Twitter chat, because you've got the Twitter chat, you've got the blab on air activity, and then you've got the, the comments in the sidebar. So now you've got three things going on. Right. Right. Um, which is a lot like I've, I've been hoping for um, some kind of Twitter integration because the other thing is some of these chats are core communities on Twitter. So we don't want to just say, well, work smart, not hard and give up the Twitter piece because that's where they were born. And some of the community really lives there. So it's an interesting challenge and I'm interested to see how that kind of progresses. If any changes come along that, that make us adjust our thinking so far, we're just kind of trying to maintain it all knowing that, we might lose people in one spot or the other. So we have a couple good questions to start off with. I'm actually going to go to Mitch's question first because sequentially it makes more sense and then go to, go to Alex. So hang in there, Alex. Um, Mitch says, Kristen, you do a, a great job as a community manager. Where did you learn to do what you do? And is community management available today as a college course? And if not, should it be? I love so much about that. Okay. <laughs> So, um, and thank you for the compliment, Mitch. I learned uh, sort of unintentionally, um, like I said, it dates back to me um, being asked by someone else to get involved in a forum. So I kind of started learning some of the fundamentals of online conversations um, during that. And then um, I would say early, late 2013, early 2014, I started kind of becoming a student of Twitter. Um, I was familiar with it and had used it, but I had never really gotten super involved with it. And I started using it a lot more um, as I found value in it for networking and attending chats to learn and to meet new people. So I really just kind of learned by feel. Um, yeah, and it's in terms of college courses, I don't know that there is a degree program for it. I'm sure there are courses at some schools that, that are relevant. And I know there are some, um, some online training courses. I'm not really well versed in them where you can get some kind of a certificate. It's not really accredited um, type thing that I know of, but there are some formal education uh, type things that you can do. But to be honest, I haven't done any of those. <laughs> right. I, I think probably like looking at, at some of these organizations that specialize in like startup and digital marketing and stuff that that are sort of outside the university system are probably going to be a little more cutting edge because by the time a, a course gets approved to be a for credit and all that um 
things are changing so quickly, you'd be learning, you know, a course would have in its curriculum by now, Google Plus, right? And <laughs> by the time Blab gets on, the way we use Blab may have changed or we may be on a different, <laughs> we may be in a different format or something, right? I muted myself. Yes, exactly. It's a question of agility um, and being able to adapt quickly to the, the emerging technologies and, and new information, you know. So yeah, that's been a historically something that we belly ache a little bit about. <laughs> what are the what do you think the core skills are though? I mean, certainly multitasking, as you've said. What are the other, you know, sort of foundational skills that you need to be a good community manager? I think you have to be, I think you it really helps if you like people, you know, genuinely just enjoy um, talking to people and you like people. I think it helps if you are passionate about whatever the community itself is. Now there are community managers who work in a community that doesn't really directly relate to their passions, but I think it helps if you really enjoy the, um, the core reason for the community, whatever that is, whether it's common interest or a brand or, um, you know, nonprofit, whatever, whatever the case may be. I think that helps. And then the other thing is some basic, um, Patience and tenacity. <laughs> I think those are things that are just kind of really um, fundamental things that you'll find among most community managers. Let's go to Alex's question. Um, with the increasing growth of live streaming and new social media platforms like Snapchat, how are you seeing the role of community manager evolve? Well, I think you definitely, for one thing, you're going to see um, community managers weighing in and executing on more platforms. Um, obviously. I think to some extent that's going to go back to varying based on the scope of the individual community manager, manager's job. But like I can speak for myself when it comes to the communities that I'm involved with, I have spent more time thinking about and interacting on live streams, mostly other people's, um, this year because a lot of our community members are there. So I don't always wait for them to come to us. Sometimes I try to reach out and catch them where they are, um, even right. if it's your individual Periscope channel or a blab that they're doing. That is a very daunting task, and I'm not able to um, catch everybody, but I try to do that, especially with the people who regularly interact with us. Um, I think it's important. Um, so yeah, I think we'll just see the, the purview and the scope maybe change a little bit. Maybe you're, you'll have more community managers coming up with ideas and engaging on Snapchat or on Blab. Right, right. Now you're also very comfortable being on air and, and being a guest or being a host. And I noticed, I was doing a little research and I noticed that you did a Periscope challenge where you did like 30 Periscopes or 31 in 31 days, something like that. Talk mm. about that and like what that experience was like and either why you've decided to continue with Periscope or why maybe you've decided Periscope you know, isn't for you. I'm so glad that you brought that up because that, that was a really interesting experience for me. Um, being comfortable on camera ish <laughs> is new for me as of this year. I never did my first hangout on air until the beginning of 2015. And I was horrified every time I saw my face on camera. It was just awful. I bet if I went back and watched one of those, I would just cringe and crawl under my desk. Um, I think it's just a matter of repetition. So with that said, going back to the Periscope challenge that you mentioned, um, Amy Schmitzauer, AKA Savvy Sexy Social, um, does a challenge every April and August um, that she calls Savvy Sexy Social's VEDA. And that stands for vlog every day in either April or August. And so video blog, right? Well, Periscope had just gotten really big. And I thought, well, instead of trying to do YouTube videos because I can't produce them and I can't have good lighting and that's just not gonna happen. I decided I would marry it with my curiosity about Periscope. And so I would have to do a live stream every single day for the month of August. And that was very um, intimidating initially, but it was a great exercise for me because I got used to, first of all, thinking it through, if only for a couple minutes beforehand, what was I gonna talk about? Because I had to have something and, you know, was I going to try to keep it short? Was I, did I have a lot more meat that I wanted to put in? You know, so I had to think it through in advance. Then I had to actually hit the, hit the start button, see my own face, <laughs> look at people's comments. And then, believe me, that was really 
I don't know why, but I found that more intimidating than standing up in front of a room of people. Right. But I right. found that as I got started getting further along in the month, after about say maybe the second week, I didn't hesitate anymore about hitting the button. Sometimes I was still like, okay, this is terrible. I have to go. But <laughs> you know, I, I got very um, tolerant of myself. Um, and I did make some observations that helped me feel a little bit more comfortable moving forward. So that was a really good experience. And I honestly think that just getting comfortable on camera has just been about repetition and just forcing myself to, to do it. And so now I just, I'm, I'm like, okay, it's fine. <laughs> so where does Periscope fit into being a community manager? Is it something that you use to like promote content that's coming up or shows that are coming up or is it not really something that, you know, is a, is an integral part of community management? <laughs> Excuse me. I haven't really used it that way, although um, because I don't create content. So most of the communities that I'm involved with, somebody um, that spearheads that community is using live streaming to create content. You know, you see Brian um, right, I, right. on Periscope a lot. So what I try to do is amplify and participate in his Periscopes. And, and actually, um, Jay Bear, he actually is doing um, some live streaming via the Facebook mentions. Um, on his Facebook page, which is a lot of fun. Um, so what I mostly do is try to amplify those. Um, I haven't used it a lot myself to amplify um, anything that I'm doing, but I did find some success with, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the No Kid Hungry initiative. It's uh, yeah. nokidhungry.org and the previously mentioned Tim McDonald and Brian, uh, lots of people are big supporters of that. So I did a couple of periscopes on um, one of the days that was a big push for that cause. Um, and I was really happy with how that turned out because what, what I was telling people to do is, Hey, go look for this hashtag or go to this website. So I can see the power of it there. I just haven't used it much in that way personally. Mm -hmm. And the link for no kid hungry is in, uh, thanks to Mitch and thanks to Robin for putting it in the, the chat box. And, you know, when people think about community management, they think about amplifying an existing community or building an existing community around, usually around a topic, around, uh, you know, a goal, around an organization, around a cause, uh, around the, obviously around the business uh, brand. Um, but what about um, somebody from a community management angle who wants to start, uh, you know, start a new community as, as Alex asks? This question brings me joy. Um, I left out a little piece of my background, which is that in 2008, I started a community. Um, what well, the reason I started it feeds into my answer. I was looking for a very specific type of community and I couldn't find one. I found some that were kind of sort of adjacent or maybe there was a little overlap, but there wasn't one that was exactly like what I wanted. So I did my research first. So that's a recommendation. Um, if you if you see a lot of communities, and especially if they're good ones that already are doing kind of what you had in mind, I, I encourage you to take great pause before proceeding because you might be better off to get involved with what's already there rather than inventing the wheel because it can be a lot of work. Secondly, um, figure out where your community is going to live. Um, where are the people that you want to join this community and how are you going to structure this community? Are you talking about a social media initiative? Are you going to build a website, which is what I did. I used a content management system. I figured out how to build, put in a forum and you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so you got to decide that. And then just know that if it goes the way you want it to, it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> you, need to, you need to be the biggest so my biggest part of my answer is the the level of commitment and enthusiasm for it and then i also recommend um enlisting um help have have some some buddies or or colleagues or whoever that are have share the same passion and interest and can kind of back you up a little bit because if it goes well it is a lot of work so a major part of the community management picture is amplifying and responding and interacting while an event or while a, a broadcast or a Twitter chat is going on. What do you do, like now that you're doing um, community management for Blabs, what do you do with the Blabs or even the Periscopes if they're related to Social Business Hour, Convince and Convert? What do you do with that material once it's over? In most cases, it gets uh, re-shared 
um, because in theory, what you've done is you've you've had a good discussion um, that that is relevant. And of course, it depends on the topic and how well it went as to um, when and how often you might share that again. Um, if it's something really event specific, it may not be worth you know sharing it out again. But you can. There's a lot of different things that you can do um, to make that hour go past the hour. Um, you can, as you know, Ross, you can embed a blab into a blog post. You can do a recap. You could um, shout out the people who came in and supported you. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can can do that. And a lot of people do podcast recordings here in Blab. Um, Jay just did one today that I had to miss because it was the same time as social business hour. But that piece of content will become an audio podcast. Um, so if, if the content itself, if whatever the discussion was is evergreen or has merit for somebody who missed it, you go ahead and you share it again or you repurpose it into a, a piece of content that can live on your website. And now when Jay does the, the podcast, he's recording it live on, on Blab or is that, is that always or just something he does once in a while or? He's only done it a couple of times. He did it a while back. He actually had Brittany from Blab um, okay. on, and the podcast is called Social Pros, and it's mm -hmm. an amazing podcast. If you go to con convincingconvert.com, you can see all the different, um, you can see the blog and the different podcasts um, that are related. But anyway, um, so today, what he did is he recorded an episode of Social Pros. He does not always do that. Um, he may do it again in the future. Um, you may see more of him on Blab, which would be awesome. But today he just decided to go ahead and do it on Blab and um, it looks like it went really well. Um, and so they'll take that audio and I'm sure they'll, you know, edit it. I don't, that's stuff that I don't understand. <laughs> but they'll well, edit just it. use the audio that they, they email you, right? Because at the end of it, I think or some people use be, like their own equipment or whatever. Yeah, I think there might be some wizardry that you can do if you know how to do that stuff. I'm not going to pretend like I understand that. <laughs> right, but right. the episode that Jay recorded on Blab today, so now people can see it on Blab if they want, or they're going to be able to very shortly, they'll be able to get it as, you know, one of the podcast episodes. And it, it makes easier the, the, the part about doing the interviews. I mean, I'm sure for for all the time that Jay's been doing this, he's got a great setup and it's easy for him to patch in a phone call or use Skype or whatever. But for people who are just getting started, it's a great way to, to interview somebody and you get the audio and you get the video. So, you know, you have different ways people can engage with, with the conversation, whether it's joining live, whether it's watching the replay or or listening to a podcast version, either of the entire thing or something that's cut up and, you know, edited and, and, and shared in bits and pieces. So exactly. I think it's, it, it's really democratizing, not only video, but, but podcasting. I agree. And Blab specifically has such an amazing community of people who are just excited about Blab itself. Right. Um, that, like I mentioned earlier about reaching new people. Um, and I really think that Blab is, um, interestingly good at that um, right. you know, it has a lot of advantages and are you seeing more and more people coming to blab um new people in your in your chats i mean i'm seeing like a lot of the same people i'm seeing a little bit of expansion um but there's a core group that's very passionate about it and then now the next step is to obviously try and and bring more people to this and expand the, the social conversations and you know, eventually, I guess some celebrity will find Blab or or somebody will do do a different topic. Right now, it seems like we're all talking about social media, live streaming, Blab, marketing, business, entrepreneurship, which is great. But I, I think and I love it. And it's what what I focus on. But I'm sure that there is a market out there for a lot more. And I don't know. Do you see that that's coming? Do you think it's there already and it's just at different times? Do you think? You know, what, what do you what do you see in 2016, uh, you know, for, for Blab and how it can how it can evolve? Well, predictions are not my strong suit, but I do think. That but I'm going to ask anyway, because it's the end of yeah, the year. We'll have to I do that. There will be a wider adoption because those of us who use and enjoy Blab are going to keep talking about it. And these kinds of things can take time. And one, another thing that's so interesting about Blab is Blab is not really the first of its kind. Right. Um, they have improved upon some some other versions, kind of, and they've they've done an, a, an amazing, just incredible job of 
um, doing updates and improvements and staying plugged into their community and, and listening and, and that kind of thing. So I think they definitely have that going for them. But it has shown us the potential of real time collaboration in a way that we never was not widely adopted before. So I think it will become more widely adopted. Um, it's just too easy. And I think that eventually we'll get people like a lot of my friends don't do Twitter. It's just right. not not going to happen. But I think I have friends who like Facebook who might actually want to come in and say, watch you and I talk. Right. Right. That. So. I think it's going to, I think it definitely will, will continue to grow. And I do think you're right that there might be a catalyst there. There might be some, you know, <laughs> mega star that kind of, um, tips the scales. Uh, I don't know, but I do think it will be growing. I, I mean, I think this is also a good application that, that businesses could use for anything from interviewing and hiring to conferences. Obviously there'd have to be privacy settings and all that, but I'm guessing that behind the scenes, there must be some idea of monetizing it either by by having services for enterprises or, um, you know, having some sort of subscription service for another level. Right. I mean, there's got to be some other, you know, I mean, it's great. This technology, there, there must be some plan. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the long, long game is. I know that they've said over and over that they're not going to do that um, in terms of making private blabs because there are other platforms that are more suited. To that if it's going to be private you don't need the sidebar you don't need the share you don't need some of the functionality that's in here so i i kind of like that though they know right. what they want to be and what blab is and so they're just focused on improving that the revenue stream to come later i couldn't possibly guess <laughs> but right, right yeah so Chris Barrows just joined us, and uh, Chris brought community to podcasting through his YI Social podcast and his community of supporters there. So um, Chris, if you want to jump on with us, he, he actually came out with a, a blog post today about live streaming and um, mentioned actually um, our discussion today. So I want to chat with him. Um, unfortunately we've got poor internet signal. If you want to, I'm going to drop you off, try and, uh, dial, try and call in again, or he dropped himself off. Okay. Charles is so, one of my favorite people. <laughs> uh, not quite, not quite. Can you hear me at least? So, uh, Mitch is calling in. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Go uh, ahead, Chris. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can, if you can hear me, that's better than nothing. That's, that's. I've had a uh, you know woes with blab before, so this is nothing new. I know. Uh, I can't believe Barrows is on a blab. Yeah. <laughs> so we just need the image like they do on the news, <laughs> like a little tag that says "on the phone" or whatever. <laughs> so it's like old-fashioned uh, a radio call in for for sure. So Chris, talk about a little bit about um, how you brought community management to your podcast. Um, by starting a, a team of ambassadors, which... Uh... Uh, yeah, no, certainly. You know, the biggest thing when I started podcasting was I found I had these really passionate people around the podcast, and I wanted to kind of embrace that. And uh, the, the best way to do it, I figured, was to reach out to them, and I just said, hey, guys, what's going on? Uh, you know, really appreciate your support. Uh, you, you know, who would be interested in being part of, a, you know, an ambassador program? And the the instant reaction was Yes. Uh, and so I, I just kind of continued to run with it uh, and it's turned into something pretty cool. I mean, now I have people, you know, writing for, you know, yisocial.com from this group. And I don't, I don't know, for me, it's just been very organic, but I, my whole approach to social is also organic because I don't, I think from a community perspective, I shouldn't have to buy any kind of love or support. If you want to support what I'm producing, uh, then I'm providing valuable content to you. So great. Uh, but if you don't like what I'm sharing and it's not for you, that's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, that that's kind of a way. And I, and I, and I, and I'm really bummed right now, by the way, that, you know, one of the few times I jump on here, the video is not actually working because that's just my luck. But we're happy to have you anyway. And I would just like to add that I am also a YI social ambassador and I love that's awesome. So um, thank you also, Chris, for the blog post today. Um, we, Chris and I met up over the weekend uh, on a social road trip. I figured we would probably meet through both of our, our involvement with NYU, but that never happened. So um, Chris had contacted me about going to see Star Wars this weekend, and 
we did our, our social road trip. And Chris also told me that he was working on a blog post about live streaming and um, wanted my thoughts and, and to recommend someone uh, as a live streamer who, you know, who's really an example of providing value. And I mentioned Mitch Jackson, who's great on Periscope and also a frequent guest here on Blab. So I don't know if you guys have met, and I know, Chris, you, you may not be able to see anybody, but... I can see people. Oh, you okay. just can't see me. I'm like the uh, Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and I just, you know, now that you've connected us, Ross, I just connected with Chris. I clicked on the, uh, the logos and links. So, Chris, it's nice to meet you. Great to meet you as well. Oh, my gosh, you guys hadn't met? No, no, no not really. No, 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 no. Oh, so, okay. so this actually works. Okay. But yeah. I, I did have a, a question for Kristen. Sure, go ahead. If, if it's appropriate. Okay. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I was thinking, listening to you describe community management, Kristen, and it seems to me like it's one of the few occupations where there are no boundaries in social media. There's no boundaries on the internet. I mean, technically, you're involved in a in a global business. And so my question to you is, um, do you think as a community, community manager, do you agree that your business isn't necessarily just local, that it's actually global? Would it be an advantage to a community manager to learn different languages? And this is where the college, edu this is where the class thing I was thinking of, you know, where you, you know how you have to take a class when you go to college, even though you're not, it's not something I wanted to do in language, um, you know, learning different languages, uh, making international connections. If you're representing a motorcycle uh, manufacturer uh, in Texas, for example, but those bikes are going to be sold in Sweden, in Norway, in the UK, it seems to me like there are no limits to how big you can build your, your business. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Agree, 100%. I would say yeah. that some, some communities or concepts, maybe less so if they're local. You know, if, right. if you're dealing with a local initiative, but I think you're right in terms of things being international. And I think in a perfect world, I would love to speak 10 other languages and don't tell Jay that I could be so much more useful to him if I could, um, because I think we tend to stick with our own comfort zone. So we mostly might tweet or talk in our native language. But what if I could speak French? What if I could actually speak French or German? I bet I could reach out and like really help the community grow and thrive even more if I had that capability. Well, um, and, I mean, so my, I my, my practice is limited to Southern California. A, a doctor will handle just LA cases generally, or maybe fly across the country doing surgery. And, oh, I didn't want to miss Brian. He'll come back in. And, <laughs> um, but I mean, you've literally got an occupation that could take you around the world. And I think that's really interesting. I think it's exciting and it's something I've never really thought about before. Mm -hmm. But the sky's the limit with how big you can grow your services, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So where did Brian I, go? I think what's, what's interesting, um, I'm going to go to Chris first, Brian, if you can just hang out for a minute. Let, um, me hey, Chris. Out, let me bounce out to give Brian a seat, okay? Okay, sounds great. Thanks okay. for right, coming on. All right, Take appreciate care, it. Bye. Let's see, do I have audio now? We, you've got audio and video. Okay, great. Hey, Brian's here. How you doing, Brian? Hey, guys. Yeah, I, I didn't speak, uh, Chris, your comment. You said bounce off and back on, and I was like, wait a second, I just stole, I hijacked his seat like in a, in a half a second, so. <laughs> it's, I think this is the first time I've seen you sitting still, Brian. Usually you're like <laughs> running through an airport like uh, OJ back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I drove down from Philly today, so it's, uh, it, I, was, I was moving today, though. And Chris, you're home as well. So look at that. Everybody's uh, everybody's set here. Yeah, I'm in the chaos that is my basement because everything in the move is in the basement. So uh, the rest of the house looks great, not the basement, of course. But you know. So one one of the interesting things I think about community management and and what Mitch raised is that while it can offer a, a small business the opportunity to literally be a global business and have customers from all over. It also brings in sort of a threat to a local business on the downside is that it's not enough anymore to just be the best in your neighborhood or the best in your town, right? Because you have you can face competition um, from the other side of the world. If somebody can do what you do better, people can buy that product to get that service online. So it's a double-edged sword. The, the world of opportunity is open to take your business as big as you want it. And also the threats are there. <laughs> to your business, it's not enough only to be the best in your community anymore, right? 
Well, I think I think part of it comes down to um, brands not valuing community managers, right? Like they don't understand um, their like shoes. Yeah, kind of losing you, Brian. Uh, see if you can dial. You can you can you can refresh. Yeah, um, Chris. Well, I'll I'll just say this. I think what's really interesting is. Um, in particular, I see the education. I think you know this, Ross. Uh, the fact is it's a very competitive state now in higher ed where we now face this world where you don't need to go to a physical place. And I know, I mean, when it comes down to it, uh, that's not something that's going to affect some of the larger institutions. The end, they'll still keep getting people. But I think for the smaller schools, the smaller private schools, the community colleges, uh, that's a route that they need to start looking at because – how can I get this education online? Because it might be what keeps a lot of these schools in business. And I don't know what the state of, I, I mean, I fear fire ed in a lot of ways. And I think it's, you know, and I, I don't, I don't know. I think this is just one of those businesses. It's not necessarily a local business, but in some cases it is, uh, albeit it's nonprofit. And then for small businesses, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, when it, you're, if you're looking for a mover, trust me, like if you've got a, an area that's, why you might pick someone 10 towns over because they'll still have a better rate, but you'll be able to discover them because of social media. So right. I think it does play a, a huge part now. And I mean, because we're we could sit here and we could do our jobs. You, you think about this, we can do our jobs from our basements. You know, we, we it's just that's the world we live in. But there's a CM who's sitting there somewhere, we don't know where they're sitting, but they're talking about an industry or or a company that's based in uh you know another country. So I mean look at what buffer is. They're all over they're all over the world. So I mean I think it's just something we have to think about. And yeah, it's definitely changes the game. Uh with good customer service, at least. I think that's the key. It has to be good customer service. Uh, not everyone's doing good customer service, and not everyone's giving enough attention to digital marketing. And I say digital marketing because you can't just think about social. It's everything. It all comes together in one place. Well, yeah. one of the things I, I was wondering is uh, doing it in higher education. As, as you know, higher education is not a fast-moving business, right? You need a committee, and you need an approval, and you need a study, and you need uh, – you know, an 80 page report before you can do anything. How have, has higher ed responded to the need to sort of react right away in real time and deal with things head on and, and um, engage with people right away? Um, you know, have, do you have that freedom or do you feel kind of, con con kind of constrained? I think it depends who you talk to. I mean, if you look at what University of Michigan has, they've got uh, they've got a fantastic system where they can basically do whatever. She's got the, you know, the the social media director there uh, has a is a great, wonderful support system. But not every school has that. And the biggest problem in higher ed is resources. And we're, I think we're continuously trying to sell the value of digital and social, uh, you know, in higher ed to the high level folks, so the presidents and uh, and the vice presidents, etc. Uh, depends where you are. But yeah, I think. Uh, some places have it. It's very different uh, depending on what university you're looking at. But I think higher ed's always been higher ed's behind, and we're constantly playing catch up. And that's what I, you know, that's what I hope to be part of a change of. And and that's why I'm in higher ed, even though the, you know, the pay may not be what it is to work in corporate. But uh, quite frankly, when it comes down to the opportunity to make a big difference, I think uh, anyone in higher ed who's working towards that, I applaud them because we are working under a bureaucracy at times. And I'm not speaking in particular to where I am. I'm just speaking as a general whole. If you go to conferences in higher ed, this is what you see. I mean, I'm lucky to have, a, a, you know, work with a group of people. We actually have a content team. Most universities don't have a content team. Well, let, me be, let me be honest. Most don't. Brian. Brian. Yeah. Oh. I mean, yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm on my phone now. So, thankfully, Brad has... Uh, has the uh, mobile device. I, LTE is much better than the Wi-Fi. So um, I jumped on my phone, so hopefully it doesn't hiccup. But um, I actually wanted to kind of, I, I think it's interesting conversation, but I wanted to say like, you know, Kristen Cardos, um, from a standpoint of like um, where Kristen was. So Kristen, what was, you were at what, Bayleaf, Bayleaf, right? Bayleaf Digital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I think there's an interesting element of a social media uh, or a company leveraging social, kind of what Chris was saying. And then, oh, is that me? No. Um, but what Chris was saying in a sense of, you know, understanding its value, linking it to success metrics. But I also think that the community manager and the value of your community has changed. And I think it's changed drastically. And, 
you know, for people that look at my success on shows and things that we've been doing, I can tell you it, it takes it takes a lot of talent to be a host on Blab, like to, to actually host and manage a room. I actually think it may, takes more talent to manage from a community perspective in Kristen Cardo's shoes. And, and, and I mean that in a sense of, you know, um, actually, I had a discussion, Julian, who's um, one of the, my new clients that I'm working with right now. Um, we were talking last night about like the power of a community manager and Chris Barrows, you get this as well Is you know, I think there's something not only from a, a trust perspective, the relationship you have with them, but the community manager to me, not only is Kristen um, knows my story, my brand, my mission, but I trust her and learn from her more so probably than she learns from me in a sense of that's my community manager, right? And like, that's, that's why I say I have the best community manager, but I think it's because of this idea of this empowerment. And I think empowerment is something that the small businesses today, if you, if you just give it to an intern or some 17 year old who happened to be looking at their phone and you said, Hey, you're a community manager, like that, you're right. They're going to be outnumbered. But I think the ones that get it, are going to actually if you, if you want me to go to your brick and mortar instead of Amazon you're going to you're going to empower your community manager to tell your story engage with me and make me feel special therefore I'm going to get in the car spend the gas and go there where if you're just doing it where you're checking a checkbox I think that's the that's the mistake and that's what Kristen I mean Kristen you could probably talk to that on what you I mean I remember when when you first kind of came on a social business hour it was like a transformation of our show from a standpoint of Kristen knew our community was an active member but I mean, ran with it. I mean, I mean, home run, we couldn't have picked someone that was more in tune with our, our community. But I don't know if that was the same case when you were with your previous work before that, Chris, and you can speak to that. Well, um, kind of only, they kind of didn't really have, they kind of let me decide a lot of things. So it wasn't like, it was different. I wasn't walking into something that already was and weighing in on that. I was more or less saying, okay, here's what isn't and here's what I think needs to be. And they were, they were actually really awesome. I loved working with them, um, right. you know, but opportunities and, and times change. So, um, but in terms of um, what you were saying before about pawning it off on an intern, I think you're right. I think there's two, two roadblocks that come up a lot. One is brands or companies or whomever not seeing the potential of having a community and someone to foster it and work within it. And then the other is trust. Some people do have a person, but they don't empower them to do great things. They only let them do enough to keep everything from breaking. And that's not how you how you make a splash or how you reach more people or how you make a good impression on your customers or the people around you. So and I would right. add they don't, they don't believe in it and they only see a downside is what a lot of like it's only what could go wrong, not how could we grow. Go, go ahead, Chris. Well, exactly. I would also add in the in the comments I'm seeing that the fact that there's a lot of jobs listed as interns, um, which is true, but I think one of the huge issues is the pay scale of these jobs may not be sometimes the jobs aren't listed as interns, but the pay scale is that of a entry level or intern. And that yeah. is a huge issue because to attract quality in employees, you need to pay appropriately. If you look at the social media pay scale, and again, I, I think it, it, if you look at it, I mean, I look at it in New York. I know, for example, some, I won't name the companies, but I know a few companies that I've looked at when I initially kind of looked at New York were, it was for 35 to $45,000. And I'm one person, I don't know how people in New York live off that because I'm not, I don't make that but I have a wife and a kid and, and we're still in New York, New Jersey saying, how the hell do we pay these bills at times? So I think that's a part of it. And if you want quality employee employees and you want quality work, you have to pay for it at some point. Uh, well, I that, think that's, yeah. That's I mean, the essence of, we want you to be the face of our brand. We want you to tell our story, know our product, engage with our customers before we do, be as in tune as the sales team, run our customer service, also understand our marketing objectives, and um, know when not to screw up. Oh, and we're going to pay you like you're an intern, right? And I think, and I think actually, and Kristen, I mean, share, I don't know if you did it before I got on, but share, I mean, I think that there's also a difference between a social media, um, and I don't want to use manager, a social media scheduler, a social media manager, and a community manager, because... I mean, Kristen is a badass WordPress person. Kristen is one that if you give her something, a problem, she doesn't come back and ask you. She goes and Googles it, finds other people to get the problem done. That's the new age community manager. It's not the community manager that said, 
I'm really good at taking five tweets from a spreadsheet and putting it in Hootsuite. I think that's what we were paying for. And now we're expecting the skill sets of Kristen and not willing to pay the difference between that person that was copy paste from a spreadsheet to, to the person that actually can control your messaging. And, and oftentimes, turn a, you can hug your hater. We can give Jay there a little bit. Or they can actually turn someone into an advocate. And it's because of the skill set change. Like from, I mean, Kristen, what is, I mean, what is your, I mean, your skill set is a, a broad range that's not your average community manager for sure. Well, I'm learning every day, <laughs> still learning every day. But you're right, there is a difference between someone who just, you know, goes on Twitter. That's not really, I hate, that's one of the common misconceptions about people that work in social media anyway, including community managers. But I, the key word there is community. It's it's about the relationships and about the the discussions and the the actual connections that are being made. Now, a lot of community managers do get involved in social media management, I know I do but that's not the only part of the job. And it's really key to have a person who can do the right thing when something goes wrong. I think that's one of the most important pieces um, is, to, is to be trusted when you do get negative feedback or you know there's some kind of a problem, that's when the rubber really hits the road. Uh, what is this person gonna do now? So it's, it's a little- I think different. many times the engagement piece is is really a higher level skill than is what are we going to tweet about or when are we going to schedule it or whatever and companies have the wrong view on that as well because i think anybody could handle engagement but it not only requires some not even though a lot of what we do in engagement is really just like a thanks and a retweet and whatever there are times where it require it, it, it acquire it requires easy for me to say knowledge of um the subject matter but also judgment of knowing how to engage with different people of getting a sense of who's legit and who's maybe just worth ignoring and you know it, there's a lot of like sensitivity to it that i think people don't see and and so i would much more easily give somebody scheduling or even you know come up with 10 tweets for this week to somebody else but I would ve be very reluctant to, to farm out my engagement to anybody. So that's that's really, I think, the heart of being a great community manager is is not only knowing what to say and when to say it, but how to finesse situations and how to react quickly in real time with good judgment. And that's that's the piece that companies are so afraid of, but it's the thing that they, they don't put any emphasis on, I, I think. I, I mean... I'll put, a, I'll put a little like, so four years ago, I, um, I left my job, I was going to another job and I was growing an internal Jive community and they wanted to give me the title of community manager. And I was like, I'm not a community manager. Like to me, it was an insult and I want to bring, bring this story full force. And then I kind of, I, I moved into a new role where I had a bunch of direct reports running internal, external community, as well as social media and onboarding. And I started to hire community managers. And I can tell you over the last two years, the number one resource that I've learned the most from on social media, number one, happens every single Friday. It's called CMGR Hangout. And it's community managers sharing their skill sets, their knowledge and lessons learned. I learned more from that show than any other thing on the internet. And it's community managers. So for me, looking back, I was I was all not only naive, but I completely misunderstood what a community manager was four years ago compared to what I believe a community manager is today. And I'm the one that's preaching community is the future of business. And I believe when you have people that you're empowering and you have the skill sets and the knowledge and the trust, like people like Kristen, I mean, I, my Periscope visibility, my lead gen, all the things that I brag about are, are because I, Kristen and I are a team on all of those things that we do. And I mean, I am, I can, I can not even underestimate the difference between four years ago, my view of a community manager and what I look at it today as I couldn't do what I do without one four years ago. I didn't even want that title. Here, here's something that's interesting, um, because I, I see the discussion in, in the chat box about employees. And um, I think, Kristen, if I'm right, you have a background in HR, right? Or you've done some HR work. Well, and I, I have a background in, in, in HR. And, you know, the, 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 the easiest thing to do, and maybe also the hardest, but certainly the, the, the biggest upside is to get your employees involved as ambassadors for your brand. And um, really to, to spread the message openly and honestly among your employees first and then let them amplify it a, a, with a genuine voice as opposed to, here's a script, please read this to somebody. 
on the telephone. And I, I don't see, you know, I see that's that's another area where companies are are, are leaving a lot of a lot of money on the table by not taking advantage of that. Um, so I guess the question for you and, and everyone is what how would you tailor community management to um, the internal side or to your you know marketing to your employees and empowering your employees to market on behalf of the company? Is it a change from the way you do it externally or is it taking the same skill set and the same approach and just applying it you know to your internal marketing efforts? Well, I mean, I, I, Kristen, go ahead. You, Kristen, you go, you jump in and I'll, I'll jump on. I was just going to say that the basics of it are the same, same concept, same idea. When you're talking, you know, employee advocacy and, and sharing the good word, you, you need to make it easy for people. So the piece, a piece of that might be the technology that you use and the way that you communicate, not just from a community manager, but from the leadership of the organization. But in terms of, and, and I'm actually going to get involved with some of this myself, but in terms of the general concepts and the general idea behind it, it's very similar. Um, and Chris, I mean, in higher education, your, your audience really is in a large sense internal, right? Because NYU has like, what, 50,000 employees or whatever, students, alumni, Same. parents, right? So you're, you're, you're really not so much worried about growing the community as you are keeping that community engaged and, and making them uh, care and be passionate about the brand. And, and certainly NYU has, has kind of rose to prominence later than a lot of other schools at the same level. So there's probably a lot of catching up to do for NYU in that area. So talk about it from, from you know, a higher ed standpoint. I think from the higher ed standpoint, the community challenge is, well, where's the, well, one, where's the pride stem from to begin with? So it depends on the audience. You've got, uh, in higher ed, you've got alumni, you've got perspective, you've got employees, you've got uh, the helicopter parents that uh, you have watching. Very important, might I add, really, really important group of people to be aware of. Uh, so, I mean, and then you've got the students, prospective students, and then the current students. So a huge, huge audience all want something very different. And then actually the student breakdown is really interesting because if you look at the students, you've got the Gen Zs and you've got the, the you know, the, the Gen X. I, you, it's, it's, it's all very different. So you got millennials want one thing, but then the Gen Zs are very different. So by the time the Gen Zs come in, you're going to have a crossroads where it's two different ways to reach people so when you're trying to reach community one the first thing is what can bring people together what can unite us and uh you know i think a lot of colleges some colleges i think have it easier than others because they've got these big homecomings they've got football teams uh when you don't have those sort of things i think you have to search for what does bring us together and one way to do it quite frankly is ask the question you know what do you like um and I don't think it's a bad thing, but if you don't have an audience that all loves one thing, don't be afraid to really celebrate a lot of the niche things that people enjoy. I, I mean, that's a big thing for me right now, I think, as a whole, which is just this idea of what are these niche interests. But uh, I think in higher ed, if you go for the niche interests and get the smaller groups together, you're still getting the students talking to one another and you're still getting alumni connecting with students of the same interest, you know? So, uh, think about those niche audiences if you don't have one big uniting factor. Because right. quite frankly, there as long as I think the goal when you talk higher ed is how in the end can we help our graduates, our alumni, our current students, um, and how can we help one another overall? Because it's education, you know, and we want to educate one another and ultimately help people do better in their life and in their career. So uh, if you put that first, it the community will ever be small or large, but it doesn't matter if you're providing them some place to go and connect with other people. Brian, on the internal side, the, the companies that you work with who are more progressive in this area, what are you seeing? What is the common denominator? What are they doing well to engage their employees and, and, and really make them believe in the brand and then spread the word? Well, I think the you know, I think the biggest question becomes if um, if you ask ten employees in your company what is your company or brand story, I promise you you're going to get ten different answers. So you know, ultimately, you're asking people to tell the story of your brand and and, and share some things. Um, you know, you know, in my opinion, that really not everybody even has the answer. So I think for brands that are getting it, it's this element of you don't have to talk on brand message. You don't have to 
um, story tell. Ultimately, you just need to be yourself because you're the person we hired to be great. But I think that also scares the crap out of a lot of, of brands and people. I think the ones that look at it and say, hey, we're going to be risk adverse in the sense of we're not going to let everybody do anything, but we're also going to be, we're going to realize that risk first reward. And if we hire great employees and we don't suck with what our product is, then we can do that. And, and Mitch asked that question about video. And um, so that's what I was in Philadelphia with. And that's what I'm working on a, on a big project on, on really empowering employees with through video to tell their story and, and seeing kind of how that drives collaboration, how that kind of transforms some of the conversation. And I mean, I think it actually goes back to Kristen. I mean, Kristen, you we're doing community management uh, from like a Twitter chat perspective prior to um, Twitter going into video chats or whatever. The, but I mean, I think I think the um, the engagement and the value of a community manager for people that are on video is actually even higher than what it used to be when someone wasn't on video, right? And I think I think that's kind of a, a new age thing um, as well. But I think um, I think brands. I mean, I I really truly believe that if you're not um, empowering your, your employees to help tell your story, um, you'll never, you'll never reach a, you know, critical mass or scale because it's, it's nearly impossible. Mitch, did you want to jump back on? You've had so many good questions and we're going so fast. Oh, here we go. Well, yeah, I love that. I mean, it's easier, it's easier, you know, for me personally to just sit and watch and listen and then craft a question because you guys stimulate, you know, you're a lot smarter and talk a lot faster than I ever could or will or ever will again. But, Too humble. But, you know, it's interesting because um, I, I was wondering, uh, Kristen, with, with your position as a CM, doing what you do, how do you see live streaming affecting what you do for a living? Like, to Brian's point, how has it changed within, within the internal structure of a company now? When you're approached by a company to do their CM, do you have a different dialogue with that company than that you might have had a year ago? Or do you see a new dialogue coming up in the next one or two years because of mobile live streaming. I mean, every single employee in a company now can be a company evangelist, right? So you have to manage that. You have to train them how to say the right thing or not say the right thing. I mean, I don't know. What are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, to be fair, I haven't had a chance to work at a level where I would have to be concerned with the training of staff. Um, or, But I guess it's, it's not unreasonable to think that that could happen or that I might be involved in helping craft you know, some guidelines. Um, I definitely think it, it comes down to having the fundamentals right because the conduct, the guardrails and the swim lane should be the same in the medium. So yeah, like there might be some nuances to the live streaming part of that. But I think the bottom line is communicating clearly where the guardrails are and what the swim lane is, turning around and making it something that would be fun if an employee does want to talk about the business in any kind of way. And I think Brian would agree with that. Um, and then just kind of. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think ultimately that's, I mean, I think that's part of the problem. I also think it's part of the, you know, if it's not built into their workflow, if it doesn't, if the employee doesn't see what's in it for me, that I don't think there's ever a chance of it being successful, but that's same with the community manager. I think a community manager that before was the, hey, you're stuck behind a brand logo. You have no personality. You are just our talking logo. I don't believe that's the way that things are going either. I think I think we're going to start to understand who's behind Coca-Cola's engagement, who's behind, you know, and I think as we do that, I think that's where video, I mean, I, I've, I've had two bad hotel experiences in seven days. And I tweeted about both of them, but I actually leveraged video in both of them, mainly because for me, it was proving like, hey, I'm not just complaining because I, I hate complaining. And then I complained twice in a row. And I was like, man, I'm like that guy all of a sudden. Don't but, be that um, guy. Yeah, I know. And I, <laughs> uh, I, give, I give a big shout out to it today. So I changed. I had to make sure that if I'm going to complain, I'm also going to celebrate when they do it right. But I actually think part of that is like, you know, if you start to understand the the person, the human behind the customer service, this whole hug your haters and Jay Bear, and I, I know Kristen's working with with Jay, but I love where Jay goes with that because you, if you're yelling at a logo, anybody can be a jerk. When you see someone, it's like, hey, I'm just a frontline person. I wasn't at the hotel you were even at, buddy. Like, give me a break, get off my case. You know, let me see how I can help you. And then um, Chris Barrows and I had this debate uh, the other day on Facebook, and it was a very active, uh, enjoyable debate on the sense of you know, where social fits in the customer service element. And to me, it fits perfectly in social media if you have a great community manager. But if you don't have a great community manager and you have a social media scheduler, it, it'll crush you. And I think that is, the, that is the, the, the essence and the difference. And I think, I believe, hopefully, 
that 2016 will be the year that we actually look at employee advocacy as not empowering employees to retweet brand crap, but empower employees to be who they are. And I think that's where I hope it goes. Can I say Can I ask? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mitch. Well, I was going to ask the three of you a question and start with you, Kristen, and that is you, you just gave a metaphor I'd never heard before, and it was awesome. It just made my whole day. I feel like all the content I just digested today, seriously, and you talked about the swim lanes. We've got the swim lanes, and the, you know I'm looking at it as employees swimming down the swim lanes. And, and theoretically, it really doesn't matter how they get from the start to the finish, as long as they finish okay, the right way, they stay within the lanes, they stay within the parameters, and they finish on task or on goal. Some people backstroke, some people do the freestyle, some people breaststroke. I think that's a great analogy or metaphor. Um, having said that, it's never been easy for any of us to go online. We click a couple of buttons and we're broadcasting to the world. So I'm wondering for the three of you, because this is your arena and not mine, um, when dealing with companies, it, whether you're helping like Brian, you know, companies bringing their product, uh, awareness, em employee advocacy, bringing the product to the world, Kristen doing focused on CM stuff, Ross, what you're doing. Um, is there a different type of training involved now? In other words, it's not it's not as difficult as it used to be to go online and share your message. Uh, almost anybody can push a button, but you got to do it the right way. And you got to have the right tools and be on the right platforms and use them the right way. I'm just wondering if the whole approach to being a CM's changed over the years, and if you see that changing in the next couple of years. I'll, I'll jump in with a with a quick point and then let the experts run with it on, on this. And and that is, I think for companies, um, eventually this is going to be training people on social media and how to use it on behalf of the company and how to even like how their profile should look and all that stuff will be as much a part of their orientation as sexual harassment training and how to use the computer system and all that because the potential, again, to either do real good for the company or to cause real problems for the company is so big that, you know, really this should be a skill set that should be developed in, in, in within your workforce. And the other thing that Brian hit on that is so big is why are companies hiring employees they don't trust? Like if you don't trust people, it all comes back to who you're hiring and then making a decision within the first three months. Is this somebody we want to make a permanent employee or is this somebody we should cut ties with? If you can't trust people, you can trust them with a, I don't know, multi-million dollar budget, but you can't trust them to have the judgment to say the right thing on social media. It doesn't really make sense. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll let Kristen and Brian you know, tackle this question. Great, great point. Get the nail on the head. Um, I think so much of this, it starts nowhere near the social media piece of it. Hire right. Understand how to attract and retain the people that you want on your team. After that, have them like you. Be a likable organization or initiative because how often do you hear about terrible things happening with a company that employees love? It doesn't happen a lot. So I think those fundamentals are actually perhaps even more important than when you start getting into the training piece, which is key, is what you want to do is you want to take the right people who love you because you don't suck and you want to expose them to pitfalls that they may not have been aware of. So you don't want to have to program them from the beginning. You want to you want to make them aware of something they didn't already know, but they're already the right person in the right place. And you know, and I would argue um, almost a little bit different, Ross, in the sense of I think if we're if we're treating, and I know it's not where you were going on, but if we're treating social media training um, like we do sexual harassment training. Um, I think we're doing it wrong in the sense of sexual harassment isn't going to change over the next two years. Um, live streaming didn't exist a year ago, right? So like the idea that we still onboard and we call that a training event and we teach them everything in the world, and then five years later they say we're not we don't have any training like that's. That to me, but I also put that. I actually put that on the the employee mu as much as anyone else. Like I, I will take any millennial to task if they complain about not being, uh, not given training. And I'm like, you got to YouTube University will train you on every single thing you ever need. Get out on your own. Go, you know, spend a half hour a week on on training yourself. But I actually think what Kristen, what you were kind of saying there, even in the in the trust element, and and I think you hire not only hire correctly, but I, I think this this also comes down to how we talk about it. Every company, and I would even argue 
even a company that's hiring a majority of millennials today is going to have digital dinosaurs and digital natives. And if you aren't creating training and swim lanes and understanding for both of them, you will fail. Because right now we look at it and we say we're only going to train to the natives and then the digital dinosaurs feel left out and they're the ones we're worried about. Or we've dumbed it down so much and we only train the digital dinosaur and then the natives are like, hey, I'm already doing this. Like this is this is kind of ridiculous. So for me, I think we have to almost reframe that question back and say, what is our, what is our value? What is our, our, our common baseline of skill set? And let's make let's make social media. Let's make brand storytelling a recurring training event and then let's celebrate those that are actually freaking doing it well because nobody is going to be willing to actually start doing this stuff if they don't see an ev- a benefit for these people that are going above and beyond and i think every company does that wrong they do not they do not say like hey this because this community manager saw this person they, they got a, another week to stay at our hotel because this community manager is so great that should be blasted across your entire entire internal intranet telling them this is what happens when we do it well. Look at this. Look at this champion, because I think other people are going to start to see that and learn from it. And that's a training event right there. I, I saw earlier someone said train through experiences. I'm a big proponent of that as well. You know, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to check out. I'm going to have to check out you guys. Uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt, Ross. I didn't mean to. But can oh, I just no. leave one one last comment? Yeah, go ahead, I just got a text. Uh, we have tacos at home, so I'm going to have to get going. OK, oh, I'm but, um, now. Hey, you know, it sounds good. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. What I'm hearing from the three of you is it requires a new mindset, both from starting from the top and really coming in through the front door as a new employee. And I get that. The biggest challenge I've seen with some of my clients who have no idea I'm as I'm as involved in social as I am. They just look at me as the trial lawyer is they're adverse to trading and change because it costs the company money. All right. And they're not looking long term. Just look short term. They're worried about shareholder wealth. They're, they're worried about quarterly profits. Everything they do that requires more expenses being incurred to train, to bring in you know, a CM or something like this, they look short term because they have to create immediate shareholder wealth. And that's the problem I'm seeing with larger companies is they're not seeing the big vision. So they're not spending the money. They're not creating this new mindset, this new culture. And in the long run, it's going to kill them. And I think the trick is, is for someone you know, someone to come in and lay it out for them so that they can see how over the long term, you know, the CEO can be a hero and not, you know, out we, the door. We measure success on the short term. And so we compensate it's, people on the short term. We, we you know, and, and social is a long game. I mean, it's all about developing customers across their lifetime. and, and But it, customers it, might be, it might be changing now. The, I, I actually think that's the weird video aspect here that we, we really haven't figured out yet. I actually think that we've always said, and I love t- Ted Rubin. I co-host the show with Ted, um, return on relationships, and it's a long game. I actually think return on relationships when you're leveraging digital eyeballs is transforming how long that game is now, right? And I think for me, Mitch, to your answer your question, I, I point the target, right? You, you're so risk averse. You don't, you don't want to see those shareholder wealth. Guess what? When you screw up and you haven't built a relationship with your community, don't go asking for forgiveness and not to be put on blast. But when you yeah. invest at the beginning and you build that relationship and you screw up, guess who advocates for you? And so for me, I actually I love turning that on their head and saying, guess what? You, you think you think social is risk adverse. I mean, I worked at a data center. We had a 99.9% uptime guarantee. We refunded their entire year on their entire services, hundreds of thousands of dollars. We went down for more than one minute, right? So like, we had a huge risk for, for, versus reward. And I went back and said, do you want me to look at that employee, that, that person and say, all right, well, I'm not going to put it on social media because I don't want people to research your data center and realize that you had downtime and violated my contract. If I asked them that afterwards, because we didn't want to invest in a community manager until we screwed up. And now all of a sudden we need to build a community because we're, we screwed up. That is too late. And I think the examples like Target are perfect on saying that was wrong. If they had invested in community first, they want to been in the biggest storm as they are. You know, Target's Target's still around, and it's it's look, it's not an option. It's something that companies need to do. It's just twisting their arm and getting them to do it. You know, I mean, I get that, but as as the owner of a company, I, I understand the the pushback from investors, especially when I look at my clients. And I think when you look at, for example, like a blockbuster video type of example, is what's the cost of you not bringing in these ideas today? You may end up like Blockbuster in three years. To that point, I just want to say something. To that point, a lot of you have said nice things about me as a community manager. I think I do okay at it. But I'm going to tell you the biggest reason, I know a little something, but the biggest thing is I work with the right people. 
they they make it a priority. I am empowered yeah. to actually do things that don't suck. And that is the biggest part of why it works. That right there, the fact that they make it a priority and the fact that they empower me to do anything. Those are the biggest things. So and you, you Chris, Kristen, I pick my clients so too. Chats. You participate in so many chats that, you know, are beyond what you do for your job or the, the ones that are your sort of your communities. You stopped by like my first three labs. You didn't you didn't need to do that. Small audience. I was just getting started. You didn't even know if it would be a discussion worth listening to. But by doing that, you're engaging with so many more people and hearing so many. So you're seeing what works. You're seeing what doesn't work. Um, it's great. You can't, you can't read that, but I, I have to get my butt home for tacos, you guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Thank Thanks, Mitch. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. Well, Ross, yeah. I think you have Ross. You had a really good point there on what Kristen um, uh, on not really just even the dedication side, but I think in the new age of a community manager, it, when people say you need to know your audience and you need to understand the community that you're serving, um, that's a nine to five, right? And it doesn't exist without watching, right? And I think uh, you know Kristen, in my opinion, is one of the very best people on Periscope, hands down. And other than a month of her doing it every single day, which is better than I ever did in any month. <laughs> but she still rocks that completely. Um, I, you know, she's not on video on Periscope every day, but what she does is not only build a community on my channels when I'm live, but she's engaging in every other channel and understands how different things work. And I think the, I think today's community manager, if you say, I need to know my audience, I need to know my community, but I only work nine to five and I'm not even gonna go play where they're at. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna wait till they come to me. That's the wrong community manager side from it. But I think, I think that's, I mean, one of, one of my favorite, like, I think, missions or things that I've learned from Kristen in a sense of, I, I realized by all of her watching and learning, uh, oftentimes I don't have to give direction because her direction is actually better than mine on how she's going to engage the community because she knows them better than I do. And I think when you get a, when you get a community manager that can support you that way, I mean, holy crap, is that a change in like mindset and delivery? And for me, I focus so much more on, on what I'm really good at because I'm letting Kristen do what she's really good at. And it's because of all that extra stuff. And I think that is so underestimated. And I, and I, and I, I hope, I hope that like, I mean, I would love to see people take the Kristen model of what she does, how it works. I mean, I mean, Jay, Jay's already uh, uh, jumped on that ship, but I think, I think that's something that, that, that can be really good, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump off and listen to someone else, but uh, cheers, Claire. How's it going, my friend? Good. How about you, Brian? How's life? Going good. Thanks so much, Brian. Appreciate good, good, good it. Good to hear. Yeah, you know, my main point in jumping on here is I want to be talking about some things regarding the community, but then also combine it with some of the corporate culture and things. So let me give you two examples here. Before I got into the digital mar marketing world, I was in a totally, totally, totally different industry. Um, it was an organization that I will say, though, in the public eye, it wasn't all that positive and I'll admit it, the reasons were kind of justified. But you know what? It was the best company I've ever worked for. I had close to two months worth of training before I even stepped foot in doing the actual job. They treated their employees great when it came to continuous training, even things like benefits. Pay was was that was definitely acceptable. The people over there, they loved working for the company and they had pride in it. There were times I went out in the community, told people I work for XYZ company. It looked at me, man, sucks for you, you work for them. And I said, let me tell you a different story. Listed like four or five different things, changed their mind completely right then and there. Unfortunately, that was before social media became what we know as social media right now. So, yeah, I can't really quite go out there and say this stuff. On the contrary, though, they, um, I had a blog that was in relation to that particular industry. And I put a disclosure on there that, yes, I work for XYZ Company. I got called in to the office with a couple of managers the next day. They told me I had to remove the company name off the blog. Wow. So I, I said, okay, fine. I'll go go ahead and do that. If you want me to go do it, I'll do it. That was the first thing I did when I got, when I got home that, that day. Um, but, I mean, you know, so it was community agency without them asking about it. But – they got it because of how well I feel like that they treated the employees. And I did that out and about, if you get what I'm saying. And I feel like I'm really glad I did that. Um, Sometimes you're ahead of where the company is, right? I mean. Yeah. So 
Then the other thing here is I actually interviewed with a company this past week. Uh, it was, I won't say the, the name of the respective organization, but it was trying to help oversee their digital marketing efforts. And one question I asked them here is, so what, what, so what, so what's your onboarding? Oh, we don't have, we, we, we don't have any. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, we're just going to th throw you in one day. We'll meet every day until you actually get it. Like, Okay, I can do that. But in reality, I said it was sad because it was a company I was really excited to interview for. But that, but, one, but, but that one question there just blew it. It really, really did. And I'm just like, I'm sorry. The amount of energy I have, enthusiasm I have, is just went down like seventy five percent. So you know, it's not the right place for you. I mean, you want you don't want to be somewhere where you feel like you're working with your hands tied behind your back, and yet you have to sit there all day, but you can't do what what you're what you're capable yeah, of doing. Exactly. On the contrary, and, though, I talked to another company, and it was kind of doing a little bit of similar work. And I asked them. Um, so I mean, the initial phone call, I wasn't all that thrilled with it. And I said, okay, let's let's go on. You know, proceed. And then when I went ahead and proceeded and actually asked them about the training questions, I loved it. It was like, great. You know, you actually, you know, he said, by the way, we want you to be, be doing this when you first start. And then as time goes on, we'll have you do this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, good. That's learning and growing and the advocacy of things. I'll tell you, though, but the chances of me saying something positive about them on social media in the future will be a lot greater than posted to some of, the, some of these other places. That's right. They got to know that that somebody who's interviewing for a job is also a potential customer, is also somebody who can amplify, you know, their brand and what they're doing. And companies don't aren't in the mindset of thinking like that. It's just, OK, this is an applicant. And so what? But it's not anymore. In today's world, there's Glassdoor, there's blogs, there's social media, there's videos. And you you really don't know who can spread the word in a way that can you know, can really hurt your brand by how you treat your applicants. And that's why, you know, some good companies really focus on the applicant experience and also how they exit employees when those employees are leaving, yeah. you know, to put them into, a, you know, an alumni network and, and things like that. Listen, we've gone way over, Kristen. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you on. You've contributed so much to the community. Um, and live streaming and social media. And um, I, I've just really, really enjoyed this discussion. And, you know, we could probably go on for two more hours, but I know you've had a long day. I want to let you get to your family and have dinner and everything. So a lot of um, thank you for having me, Ross. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you, Claire, for, for joining us. Thanks to Brian Fanzo. Thanks to uh, Mitch Jackson. And thanks to um, Chris Barrows for all for coming on. And uh, we'll see you back here next week, 7 p.m. Eastern, Monday, live stream starts. Our guest is Bonnie Frank. We're going to talk about how to build a business on Periscope. Have a great week and a great holiday, everyone.